Hello and welcome to today's virtual coffee talk webinar. My name is Margaret and I will be your web host today. We have a few housekeeping announcements and then we'll introduce our speakers. As a reminder, in order to earn CPE credit for today's session, please stay connected to the webcast for the entire program and participate by responding to at least three of the interactive poll questions. Secondly, there will be a course evaluation which will be open in a new window upon exiting the webcast at the end. With that, I'll introduce our speakers. Kevin Jacobs is a Managing Director with Alvarez and Marcel Tax in Washington, D.C. and the National Tax Office Practice Leader. He brings more than 15 years of experience in tax matters in both the public and private sector. Stephanie Dowdy is a Managing Director with Alvarez and Marcel Tax in, in Houston. She brings more than 20 years of expert level R&D tax credit experience and is considered a technical expert in her field. Simon Bernstein is a Managing Director with the Global Transaction Tax Group of Alvarez and Marcel Tax LLC in New York. His primary, primary areas of concentration are tax aspects of mergers and acquisitions. Sandra R. Brown is a principal of the law firm of Hawkman, Salkin, Tosher, Perez, PC in Beverly Hills, California, where she specializes in criminal tax investigations, including, including and related to grand jury matters, court litigation, and appeals. Finally, Kevin DeYoung is a lead product manager with Walters Kluwer Tax and Accounting. He will be showing us today how to find additional answers and resources using CCH Answer Connect. Thank you. Kevin, take it away. Great, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll let you all decide uh, which pres part of the presentation is the trick and which part is the treat. But when we thought about it being on Halloween, we figured what is a scarier topic right now than the employee retention credit. And that's why we felt we didn't even need to get dressed up for it. Because ultimately the, when the takeaway from today's panel is going to be, it is not too late to possibly qualify for an employee retention credit. But with that said, you should do so with caution because there are a lot of mills out there pushing for these credits and the IRS has become knowledgeable of that. It's on their radar. And so what you'll see today, we're gonna talk about what is the employee retention credit? How do you qualify? What is the IRS recent guidance dealing with moratorium of processing claims? How do you withdraw them? Possible whistleblower claims? Um, and then thinking about, well, I've now claimed this or I'm potentially claiming this, and how does it handle the M&A side of things? If I'm a buy side, sell side, what is being done on a diligence perspective? And then lastly, the IRS, as mentioned, is looking at this audits, penalties, criminal cases galore. And when you're thinking of employment taxes, you always have to be worried about, okay, is there trust fund liability or not? Um, how does that apply? What is being refunded and the like? So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, as always, our, our panelists are, are going to do their best to address as many questions as possible. Feel free to in, you know, submit your questions and if there's time, we'll, we'll happily address them. But with that, Stephanie, why don't we just start delving into what is the employee retention credit? That sounds great. Thanks, Kevin. So what we're going to cover here today is, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time here because I think we all are pretty comfortable with what ERC is, right? So ERC is refundable credit filed against payroll taxes. It's meant, the, the intention of ERC was there to help businesses during COVID who continue to pay their employees. That was the important piece of this, right? So what we're looking for is that companies qualify one of two ways. Once they're qualified, they can capture credits. Two very different scenarios depending on the year. So in 2020, you were looking at a credit maximum of $5,000 per qualifying employee. In 21, it was $7,000 per quarter. You'll see here I'm talking about Q1 through Q3. I'm intentionally leaving recovery startup businesses out of this just because it is its own um, interesting scenario that's very different than this. The, the one sidebar I will say is for recovery startup businesses, please be very diligent when you are looking at controlled groups, identifying things in the aggregate, predecessor businesses. These are all very important factors. You can't start a new business, already have three, start a new one and say it's a recovery startup business. If those other businesses have been around for years, have revenue, it has to be looked at together in certain scenarios. So 2020, we've got $5,000 per employee. We've got large and small business. The deciding factor there is the number of full-time employees cut off at 100. 
in 2020 compared to 21, which is 500 or fewer full-time employees. And again, one of the things that we see through diligence, an error, one of the more common errors is companies are looking at their number of employees in that particular tax year instead of looking at that base year of 2019, right? So this is always based off of your employees in 2019. Um, you can scroll forward, Kevin. Thank you. So qualification. So it's really important to, to understand the differences in qualification, what actually qualifies, what doesn't qualify. There are a lot of interpretations, um, especially of government orders. What is a government order? So very quickly, we'll talk about the declining gross receipts. Your declining gross receipts is you look at the quarter in 2020 or 2021 compared to the same quarter of 2019, and do you meet a threshold of decline in revenue? That decline being 50% in 2020. And it's important to understand that it's not every quarter that's 50%, it starts when you've reached that greater than 50% threshold. It ends the quarter after you've reached the 20%. For 2021, same thing, you're gonna look at the quarter in 21 compared to the same quarter in 19. There is an alternative quarter process in 2021 that allows you to look at the prior quarter. If the prior quarter qualified, then that quarter qualifies. Keep in mind, again, something that I see a lot in diligence is that if you are looking at Q1 of 2021, you're gonna compare the alternate quarter being Q4 of 20. Q4 of 20 has to meet that threshold of that 20% decline. With that, that does not mean that Q4 qualifies. It just means Q4 was used to qualify Q1. I've seen a lot of companies claim a credit in Q4 when they didn't actually qualify for it. So the big piece of this is the government orders. Seems like it should be straightforward, but it's really not. We've gotten a lot of guidance, um, but there is no just true definitive source that says this is a yes and this is a no. You really have to look at interpretation. You have to look at FAQs. You have to look at everything that the IRS has released, history, understanding, intent, uh, you know, to really make a decision as to what qualifies and what doesn't. I think probably the best way to look at this is a full or partial suspension of operations. Those are the key words here. You had to have had that. It doesn't mean that you had to wear a mask to work. It doesn't mean that you had to have a glass partition up. It means that you had to somehow fully close or partially close your business, suspend operations. That is a very different threshold than I had to occasionally clean, I had to wear a mask, you know, we had to, we had, our clients weren't interested in coming in any longer, right? Those are very different thresholds. So I'd say those are the ones that you want to pay the closest attention to and be the most thoughtful of. You when you look at it, you know, it's easy to determine whether or not, while there is some nuances whether or not you qualify for the significant decline and and as stephanie noted the government order there really is these two parts what is the order and merely just saying that there's an order the order has to actually apply to you it's not just oh there's this order um and so they've made that clear with the irs faqs they've also made clear like osha guidance is not a government order so we've seen a lot of people trying to claim the credit saying well osha said i had to do x y or z like wearing the masks or separation that's not sufficient um and then you also then have that full or partial suspension but with that we're gonna launch into the first polling question and again please make sure you answer it in order to qualify for your credit um, have you claimed the ERCs? Yes, no, or no, but we're considering it. Um, so while they're answering, Stephanie, do we want to just keep talking about the most recent guidance on the IRS and the moratorium? Sure, let's move forward. And I will add one thing to that last slide, though, is I think it's important to understand that it's not just the government order. There's a government order and there's an impact, right? So we have to make sure that 
when you are putting together a claim for ERC, that you have the government order, but you are also describing the impact of that government order. What was the impact that order had on your business? Okay, moratorium. Stephanie, if I know. I, Stephanie can I just add a quick point on there? Because I do think that what you said about the, the impact is that, you know, a lot of businesses, and depending upon where you were, your state had rules, you may have your local government, your city, your county, every, there's all these different rules. So it's not just a one size fits all. But we also saw that a lot of employers were able to send their employees home to work remotely. And so they were still able to function um, at a, you know, fair level, if not almost complete capacity. And so the fact that your building itself may have been empty and vacant um, because you couldn't go there doesn't, you know, that's also something that people need to look at to be very careful. No, that's a great point, Sandra, that, that also, you know, we could keep going with all of these and that, you know, also think about, did you close your business by choice, right? Did you opt to say everybody work from home? If it's by choice and not under government mandate, there probably was an impact, but you don't have the government order. And if you don't have that, if that impact is not seen in your revenue, you truly don't qualify under the qualifications the way they're written and intended. So moratorium, which I know is the hot topic at the moment. Uh, it is for everybody, Senate included. So moratorium was announced on September 14th. And basically what they've said is, everybody just hold up a second. <laughs> let's just take a let's take a breather. So they had announced, they being the IRS, had announced that they had relatively gotten caught up. And I think you know, that's a relative term, right? So they had gotten caught up. Claims were typically being paid in about 90 days at that point when the moratorium came into effect. At that place, they said, we will continue to process claims that are in-house that we have already received prior to the initiation of the moratorium. However, we're going to put the other claims that are coming in now on hold. We're going to look at the claims we have at a, in a much deeper level. So I believe the language they said was expect at least 180 days of a review process. Now, I don't know to what level, and maybe this is something Sandra could, could chime in on. I'd love to understand the level of review. Is it an audit or is it just a deeper dive? Sandra, what do you think? Oh, I think you're on. Yeah, there you go, my eyes. So sorry, Stephanie, I have a contractor in my house right now, everybody. That's the problem with working remote who just asked me a question. So I turned it <laughs> off real quick. So Stephanie, repeat your question and I will so, answer it. <laughs> absolutely. So with the moratorium, they're saying that those claims that were already in house, they were, they're guesstimating at least 180 days now of processing time. What do you think is included in that processing time? Is it an audit or is it just a deeper dive review that could still then be audited? Look, you know, I'm gonna add a practicality to my answer, which is today is Halloween, yes, but it is October 31st. We are facing a, in two weeks, a possible shutdown of the government, including the IRS, and anything civil is not essential in large part, so we get shut down. We also have the reality of the fact that um, a lot of government employees have what's called use or lose at the end of the year. And so starting around Thanksgiving, um, that means many of them actually have enough leave that they don't have to come back until January 6th. So you add that in to what do you think is going to happen? Um, you know, based upon having been part of the government for 27 years and dealing with the IRS, I expect that what they're going to do is they're going to go through and they're going to make a cut and determine those that look like they really have no suspicious, no questionable, I mean, things that they can quickly get out um, and get the money out because that's what the commissioner is going to want to have done. But the rest of them are going to be put on hold till after January. That's just the bottom line. I don't see a lot of audits actually happening now because the only thing that would really happen in audit is the taxpayer gets the first IDR, which asks for a tremendous amount of information um, and is told to respond within 10 days. Um, and then it sits there, um, you know. So, sorry, a lot of practicalities in that answer, but um, our timing has a huge impact on what probably will happen. No, I, I, I think that's helpful. I do think that there's so two other data points, which is obviously, as as many people on 
this webinar know, right, filing season has pretty much just ended. So they're dealing with the influx of all of those returns that need to be processed. And this has been identified as an area of potential fraud. Now, if you zoom out, and I even say before the moratorium, um, I was working with a client for, to uh, look into the status of a refund, and it wasn't even in the employee retention credit area, but they actually currently have a, um, air, uh, a group that is designated to review what they view as um, intense or questionable employee retention credit claims. Um, the wait time, my understanding and speaking to, to some of the people that are part of that group has been about one to two years as far as the processing time of how long they're anticipating the process to take. So you have those that are in the questionable category, notwithstanding the IRS saying that they're all caught up. Um, you have those that are in the questionable category that are really going to be in a, a slow process of they're going to meticulously look at these things, as well as I think as Sandra noted, the slow processing time that's going to be in place for um, everything else as far as like just the normal run of the mill pro you know issues for okay did they actually report this correctly they're going to probably start looking at did they were you know how does this match up to the uh, income tax return so they might start doing some form of a matching program just to say okay have they reduced the amount of wages that they've done on the income tax return so the, there's a lot of things that are going on i know the service is trying to retool um and so that's in part what the moratorium is but for all the reasons sandra noted um i definitely enjoyed the user lose period when i was in the government um it, it will definitely delay things So I think, you know, to, to and, I, and I, I'll just add one more thing before we go on, because I think that this audience um, would probably appreciate this comment to the extent that, you know, the R&D credits, you know, as we've seen, you know, it's kind of a com comparable thing. They went from with the R&D, like, okay, you get it. And then all of a sudden they went back and pulled and did a stop and really started looking at it. This is a different world we are now living in when it comes to these credits because the government saw with the PPP and the COVID so much fraud. I mean, they had to start their own task force. The IRS is now, you know, in a, I think in a different mode in regards to, we need to stop the money before it goes out because this money is gone. If, it, if, it, if there's fraud involved versus legitimate credits and legitimate employers are using the money properly. But if there's fraud, you know, it, the, the money's just gone. And so the IRS is, I think, really trying to address that. And so they're going to be much more cautious. And I think that really ties into the next slide in that we've, they've made this change and this moratorium is, is functional to a certain degree, but it also has some holes in it in that, you know, what happens with, you know, some of my questions on moratorium is, what about the people who have cashed the check? What are their options? Which I know is something they're considering a, a new path coming later, per, according to the IRS this fall. And then also in mergers and acquisitions, which we spend a great deal of our time in, in the M&A world doing diligence in a transaction, you know, how does that impact the transaction? How does that impact the timing of the transaction? Are you having to respond to this differently maybe than we were before the moratorium? So let's launch into the, the next polling question of have you been impacted by the IRS's moratorium, yes or no? Um, in the meantime, we did get a, a handful of questions. I'm trying to address them as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, there's not a list of government orders. That would be wonderful if there was one. But ultimately, as Sandra noted and Stephanie noted, you have to look at what was the order and who did it impact? Sometimes it could be a neighboring county and so you don't qualify. So you really have to see what orders actually applied and there is not a necessarily easy way to do it. Now, once you find a government order, you do have to say, okay, what was the impact on the business? Was a full or partial shutdown? And then we had a question of, well, what salaries qualify? And you have to start saying, okay, was a, a large or a small employer, right? As noted on the slide, if you're a small employer, everyone, you know, all salaries qualify as long as you were impacted. If you're a large employer, it's only for the, 
for the salaries that you paid to the employees who were not providing services. So you have to further, you know, figure out were you small, were you large, and then that dictates. So, so it's not necessarily the the easiest of processes, but it is one of those things you sort of line by line, like, okay, did I did I have an order? Did it impact me? What was the impact of the order? Did it cause a full or partial shutdown? Was a large was I a large or small? employer if i was a small employer great i now know my number if i'm a large employer what information do i have to prove okay that i paid them and they didn't provide services but i guess with that I, let me add to that also is that with that another piece to keep in mind is if you were working under the government order it doesn't mean that you qualify for the entire quarter unless that government order spans the entire quarter right so government orders have effective dates and end dates and you can claim credit between those dates. You cannot go beyond. So it's also really important to make sure that not only you're gathering the copies of the orders, which the IRS will require, but that you are being very mindful of what date was it effective and what date was it withdrawn, what date did it end. So this list of questions, which I'm not gonna read, I'm gonna leave them here just so that you guys can take a look at them, but these were the questions that popped up from Senate. They wanted to know, great, you did this moratorium. What does that mean? How did you do it, number one, without us really conferring on this? And now answer these questions about how you intend to handle it, right? So a lot of these questions, I think, are very, very good questions. Uh, question eight, report illegal activities, fraud. They did come up with, uh, we'll call it a hotline. Let's say there is a way to report illegal activities, which will cover as we go forward. Um, question nine, a legislative proposal to address fraud. So they are anticipating the IRS to come back, Treasury to come back and say, here's how we anticipate going after fraud. So I find it interesting that those haven't quite been worked out yet. I also love the fact that this was due October 17th and I haven't found these answers yet. I haven't seen a definitive place that says, hey, here are the answers to your questions. So um, I thought that was interesting. Well, that goes to one of the, the participants' questions of, well, why isn't the IRS on this webinar to give answers? And I'm like, if they're not answering the Senate, they, they probably wouldn't join our webinar. Um, but <laughs> stay, stay tuned uh, for this. But there, there's been a whole bunch of questions we've gotten in the chat about, okay, well, I might have filed a claim and maybe it was wrong. It may not have been fraudulent or, or whatnot. So Stephanie, what should we know? about withdrawal so the withdrawal process i think is is a good option i'll be curious to see how much it is utilized is it going to be underutilized um so with the withdrawal process i think the important things to realize here are that it's only available to the taxpayers that have filed a claim and have either not received their refund yet or have received it but not cash the check not deposited. So that's really important. So it has eliminated everybody else. So if you got the check, cashed it, and it's just sitting there being held just in case, you cannot use this withdrawal process, right? We're waiting on another process in that instance. So with this withdrawal process, a couple things for me that I find interesting or would love to further understand is number one, in a transaction, can the buyer opt to perform a withdrawal, request a withdrawal? So if, if the liability moves to the buyer, shouldn't they also have the opportunity to file a withdrawal? And that I don't have clarity on. Open to anybody on the panel if they would love to chime in on that one. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then specifically to Sandra, I would love to get your thoughts on two sentences in this memo that said, number one, if you if your withdrawal is approved, it's like it never was filed, right? We will disregard it. And then in the following paragraph, it says, but if it's willfully fraudulent, this is not a get out of jail free card. We can still pursue you. So I'd like to understand your thoughts on how they're going to do that. How can you throw a claim out and say it was never filed, yet be liable for that claim? Sure. 
um, I'll, I'll take that over the buyer's problem. Um, <laughs> definitely, Stephanie. Um, so I think that I'll take the second part first, which is, you know, for those who willfully uh, filed a fraudulent claim um, or were in a conspiracy with regard to these um, ERC claims, you know, whether or not they're exempt from, you know, potential criminal investigation or prosecution. You know, the, the hyper-technical thing that underlies that is that the IRS, the Department of Treasury, has no authority to provide immunity. Only the Department of Justice does. So to begin with, they can't promise something that they don't have the legal authority to actually give. Um, the other thing though, is it kind of goes back to, for those who have already submitted the claim, claim to the IRS, even if it doesn't pay it out, um, but it's clearly fraudulent and there's already open criminal case, it's kind of like walking into the bank, handing the note over, and they've handed you the bag of the money and the, you know, you're reaching for it. And all of a sudden the officers walk in, you can't really unring the fact that you have just attempted to rob a bank. So there isn't actually a crime for attempted fraudulent claims. I mean, and so the fact that it was actually filed with the IRS um, and it was fraudulent, you know, arguably the act is already done. And so the crime has been committed. And so the IRS wants to make sure that it's in a position where it may be, and if they haven't found you yet, um, and we talked about this in our prep yesterday, you know, the voluntary disclosure, which I'm skipping forward, and I'm also watching our clock, so that's okay if I skip forward on a few topics, but um, the voluntary disclosure program, well, there's not one specifically to ERC out there, and a lot of people are thinking maybe there will be one. You know, my position right now is why wait? If you know you have criminal exposure and you need to fix this problem and you have not yet found out that you're under investigation, that may be what you want to do now to ensure, particularly if you've got to pay back the money anyway, or if there's no law. I mean, what better way to deprive the IRS criminal investigation of any jury appeal and using its resources on the right cases and you be the one who goes in and volunteers and says, I'm fixing this, I'm coming forward, here's your money back. Um, whatever little interest I have to pay, and then walk away. Um, you may not have a piece of paper that says you have immunity, but you're pretty close to getting immunity there for that. Um, but, you know, the, the other part of your question, Stephanie, on, okay, you filed your claim, and now the Irish is going to say, you know, it's like the three monkeys, right? See no harm, hear no harm, you know, see no harm. It's as though it never happened. This is a new world. Um, I have talked to a number of people inside CI, outside that former CI. They're like, we've never seen this before, where in essence, it's a do-over um, with, you know, basically, you know, walking away. And I think that that is in addition to the fact that there is reportedly as of last Friday, 800,000 ERC claims the IRS has not yet even touched. Um, so if they can get people to make that number go down 10%, 20%, 30% by people who now have either buyer's remorse or now go back and look at it and realize they, you know, bought a pig and a poke from someone who was promoting something they shouldn't have been. Um, that's a win-win for both sides. And that's what, what the IRS is looking at right now is you know letting them focus on what they need to focus on paying out those who are entitled to it stopping those or not and everybody kind of in the middle who shouldn't be there get them out of the way perfect we can go forward yep so let's launch the next polling question have you withdrawn a previously filed claim yes no or no but we're considering it um a few other questions just quickly before we move on is I think it's important to stress that if you don't qualify for the credit for one quarter, that doesn't prohibit you from claiming it for other quarters so long as you qualify. So we got some questions about, well, if you don't qualify for 2020, can you qualify for 2021? And the answer is yes. It's also if you don't qualify for quarter three in 2020, doesn't mean you don't qualify for quarter four. So just being mindful of that. Uh, unfortunately, we did get a, a handful of, of specific questions that we won't be in a position to answer uh, regarding um, specific facts for, for individuals um, that are attending, but just be mindful of 
you know, there is uh, several nuances that are important to, to pay attention to, both from a processing and, li and the like. You know, not every, it's not a one size fits all approach, right? So from supply chain issues, there's some questions out there as far as well, if I was, you know, similar to what Sandra said about working from home, if I, if my main distributor was, was delayed, but I was able to get, you know, similar parts from someone else, I can't just say, oh, okay, well, I had supply chain issues. So there are a lot of nuances here. And unfortunately, um, Halloween pun intended, the devil's in the details. And so you really need to make sure um, you understand what's going on. Um, and, and what is the premise of the claim? And that's really why uh, I thought it was apropos that Sandra even noted the R&D credit, because in the R&D credit space, we always talk about like documentation, 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 ERC, documentation, 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 because as Stephanie noted, they're going to ask you, what are the orders? How do you substantiate the wages? How do you substantiate, oh, these people weren't working? Like, how did you qualify under the notices? So so it's really important to pay attention to that, um, which I guess is, is perfect to, to lead us to um, reporting illegal activities. So what should we know? about this so this is this is obvious right so this is going to be the closest to a whistleblower you're going to get in the ERC world is reporting illegal activities who do you report to and how do you report so if you are aware of any illicit activities there are forms to complete materials to send in and get the process started optional as to whether or not you want to be named in that complaint in that report um, we can jump ahead. So just in the interest of time, we're going to go through a couple of these slides a little bit quicker. Supply chain. The key takeaway here is we finally got some much needed guidance on supply chain disruption because a lot of companies, what I see through the diligence process, a lot of companies have claimed ERC because they were slow to get materials, because the materials cost more, because China couldn't ship them. Those are not true supply chain disruptions. A true supply chain disruption is your supplier had a government order that caused a full or partial suspension of their operations. You have a copy of that order. You also know that you couldn't get those materials from anyone else. You were unable to pivot. So you were without, and that was your impact. You have to have all of those boxes checked to use supply chain as the purpose for your full or partial suspension of operations. And that's the really key component to all of that. Um, they did provide five scenarios and analysis in their memo, which I noted at the bottom. I do recommend that if supply chain was something that you've either already used as a claim or something you're considering, get familiar with those scenarios and make sure where you fit into those scenarios to make sure that you're claiming correctly. And then we can jump ahead to record keeping, I believe. Record keeping is incredibly important. Um, it's important just not just for the IRS. In our, our little world of, of M&A in tax diligence and transactions, we want to see everything the IRS would ask for. This is a highly contentious area, right? These claims are, they just have inherent risk just claiming it, even if it's a decline in revenue. There is just that potential for review that is greater than a lot of other areas. Have everything you could possibly need. That means copies of the orders, copy of the order that starts, copy of the order that ends it, so you can identify the dates. You know, this is all about qualification and quantification. You have to be able to, you know, as Sandra noted earlier, within 10 days, provide everything that the IRS asks for, and it will be at least this, this list. Uh, we had alluded to what's coming. What's coming is a um, couple things, right? So we've got the aggressive promoters. What is that going to look like? What, are, what is that, um, gosh, I hate, in, in the uh, interest of Halloween, what is that witch hunt going to look like, right? So we'll have that piece. And then what happens with the people that we talked about earlier, the taxpayers who filed claims, deposited the checks, possibly used them, uh, What's happening with that? Can they, will they have a repayment system? You know, what does that look like? So we'll be curious to see how that shapes up later this fall. 
And I do recommend going to Taxpayer Advocate. That will give you just a little bit more information into some of the detail of the things that they've been discussing. And then we can take one step forward and just very quickly talk about common compliance issues. And these are the issues, and Simon, I really want to lean on you for this slide because these are the issues that we are constantly seeing is that as we review from a diligence perspective in a transaction, we want to make sure, you know, on the buy side diligence, we want to make sure that our buyer is buying sound, sound credits and they're covered and that there is no risk and, and or we've at least identified what the true risk is and taken the right measures. So those areas that we see the most are going to be that full or partial suspension of operations. Again, people are relying on CDC and OSHA. CDC gave recommendations. OSHA provided recommendations. Little words make big differences, right? So you have to make sure that there's a difference between a mandated closure and a recommended cleaning, right? So those are really important. Supply chain, which we've already talked about, the big problems with supply chain was not really understanding the level that you have to rise to to meet the threshold meaning it can't just be slow deliveries. It cannot, you can't buy the material from someone else, change to a different material, right? Even if you can change to a different material, but it works in a comparable manner, right? Comparable manner is one of those things you need to think about. You work remotely, is it comparable? You change materials, is it comparable? If you can continue to function as a, as a business, where's the line on the impact, right? You may have had the order, where's the impact? So Simon, I'm really going to turn it over to you to talk about your piece of this diligence puzzle when it comes to ERC. Yeah, of course, thanks, Stephanie. So, you know, in a normal in a normal transaction, and I would say we're probably seeing for target companies, you know, north of 50% of the companies have claimed an ERC. But you know, the starting point is obviously what has been claimed, you know, both by quarter and amount. And what's the basis of that claim? As Kevin alluded to, the gross receipts test is relatively straightforward, you know, maybe a little bit nuanced. There's control groups and things like that. But by and large, it's relatively straightforward. Where we see companies relying on the government shutdown, that's when we really need to roll up our sleeves, you know, bring in Stephanie as needed and her team to really dive in to understand what's been done. Um, Obviously, the quality of the work and who's doing the work, um, you know, is also a big indicator of how much risk we see. You know, someone relying on their incumbent tax advisor that's a reputable name to do the analysis rather than some of the mills and promoters that we've seen pop up, um, you know, the latter obviously gives us a lot more concern in the context of, you know, what we're reviewing on behalf of our clients who are buying these companies. The status of the claim, you know, certainly will influence not necessarily our concern with an issue, but how do you commercially navigate something with respect to, you know, has the cash already been received versus the claim's been submitted, but no cash has been received, or, well, we haven't even pursued a claim, but we think it's there and we want to be paid for it. Um, lastly, just understanding whether returns have been amended. Um, you know, because obviously if the returns haven't been amended and they've otherwise taken a deduction for payroll taxes that needs to be fixed, um, certainly something that we need to be on top of as part of the, uh, as part of the diligence process. Um, so how does this play into the commercial, into the commercial, right? So, you know, I touched on the three, the three different scenarios that we're seeing, but for, for claims where the cash has already been received, this is most frequently dealt with an escrow. And it's not just an escrow for the amount of the ERC received, but there's also a risk for penalties and interest should you know the IRS audit it a year, two years, three years down the road. Um, but there can also be you know costs to defend that. So you know the the escrow that we would like to see put in place in a perfect world, you know, will survive the full statute and will include penalties and interest and potentially cost to, you know, defend. Um, for, for claims that have been filed, but the cash has not been received, you know, we typically like to see that, um, 
you know, similarly, you know, we have some sort of, we, we won't pay over the claim until the statute runs. That can be, you know, commercially difficult to get in place because a seller says, I don't want to have to wait three or potentially even five years to get my cash. Um, so that becomes something that we need to deal with. And whether that's backstopped by an indemnity or some other commercial mechanism to ensure that we as a buyer are protected from a potential audit that can occur a couple of years down the road. Where we see sellers roll over, for example, or where we know that there's a potential earnout in the future, that provides another mechanism for a buyer to have comfort that should something go awry here, and obviously this is all contingent on the quantums and the likelihood of an earnout being paid or the quantum or the value of the of the equity held by the rollover and who's rolling over. Is it just management or is it, you know, the, the owner of the company? All of these things will interplay into how we can contractually protect our clients in the buy side where there are claims for which we don't feel that, you know, there's either merit or that there's certainly risk. Um, we've also seen that there is an insurance market for these things. Um, so, you know, where where there is risk to a claim, we've often told sellers, you know, if you feel so good about this, go get an insurance policy to backstop your claim. And that way, we as a buyer are protected and, you know, who ultimately pays for the claim is subject to commercial negotiations. That's a way that you can get your cash today and say, look, I'll walk away, I've de-risked, and it only costs me X dollars to do so, I can get this insurance policy placed, um, and you as a buyer are insured. We've also used that as a tool to uh, push back on what we view as first claims. Um, you know, I, I worked on a transaction with Stephanie about eight months ago where it was a uh, it was a landscaping company based in a red state, and they were saying that there was a governmental order to uh, prevent them from doing their work. And he you know, went to uh, someone that we know in the market that, that places these ERC claims. And he said among the 10, the 10 uh, companies that expressed interest in the potential claim, he said none of them would write a policy for that. So that, that basically nipped the seller's uh, request for uh, to be paid for the ERC in the butt and uh, helped us uh, push that forward. Um, Sandra, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so Sandra, okay. I guess for the next 10 minutes or so, why don't you give us ideas of, of audits and what to look for? I, I will. And actually, Simon's last comment um, <laughs> actually added something that I hadn't really thought about. Look, there's no privilege for the uh, person, the seller, who's trying to get an insurance policy and told by eight different companies we won't underwrite it. Um, the likelihood that that basically puts that taxpayer on notice that this is a frivolous claim or a fraudulent claim with the IRS. It may actually be key evidence um, that would be used by the IRS in an audit if uh, they have concerns about the statute running, which is our slide up now. So I just throw that out there because, you know, um, <laughs> those are the kind of things that put taxpayers on notice. If no one's going to underwrite your uh, claim, you know, you, you probably have um, been put on notice that you might want to consider the withdrawal and or something else. But so, um, look, we, we can start out with the fact that the IRC did something very, very interesting with regards to the ERC audits or ERC credits very quickly. They sent out a ton of notices, probably more notices, almost on a monthly by every other month basis, um, letting, you know, taxpayers know we're concerned. Um, and, you know, they use the dirty dozen list, which is actually like 56 items, but um, they use that for the purposes of alerting um, taxpayers um, to scams, as well as alerting promoters to the fact that we're paying attention to different areas. So by placing the ERC as number one in the 2023 dirty dozen list, they're really making a point. They have moved this right to the top. And, you know, some of it may be because, look, I mean, the IRS, um, because of all of its confidentiality rules, is, is kind of in a catch-22 in regards to giving taxpayer information notice, whereas uh, there's probably nobody on this call who hasn't seen an infomercial, received a robocall, 
Um, you know, right. I mean, you know, I think Snoop Dogg even has a promotion out there with regards to ERC credits. Um, you can go on and on and on. Um, probably there's somebody who actually was part of the military, um, who will promote that as part of their, you know, you can trust me because, you know, I actually served in the military and I would only, you know, promote a ERC if it was legitimate. Um, and so that's hard for taxpayers. There's a lot of technical stuff here and trying to figure out if I'm really entitled to this money. It's a lot of money. Congress had a purpose for it. They want to get the money out. But at the same time, you know, you as a taxpayer or representing taxpayers don't want to have clients in a position where, you know, the penalties and the interest and the payback um, basically ends up destroying the business now in 2024, 2025 that you tried to save you know, with these ERC credits. There are a couple of things the government has done, um, one of which is normally there is a three-year statute of limitations with regards to audits, um, with regards to, you know, um, Q3 and Q4 of 2021, the statute has increased to five years, um, which means, you know, those are the qu quarters um, for anyone who has claims that are still outstanding and never been paid that probably won't be looked at until sometime next year in the latter part of next year, because they're gonna focus on the 2020 claims um, as priorities to make sure that they're not basically dealing with just simply, um, you know, three years versus fraud. Um, and, you know, when it comes to these audits, um, there is um, another thing that everybody should be aware of, which is um, the IRS basically has taken the position effective July 24th, um, 2023 with regards to section um, 3111, which is whether or not these are assessable penalties. They're basically treating these um, ERC credits if they were improperly granted um, or if the government determines they are, that these are immediately assessable penalties. Um, and by being an assessable penalty, that means you don't get your, you know, you don't get your stat notice, you don't get your notice of deficiency, you don't get your chance to kind of go through appeals and all of that. They can go right to collection, which means you are now dealing with CDP and going into tax court, okay, and trying to figure out is there an alternative remedy, um, you know, um, or basically you're going to have to full pay before you can go in, you know, to district court on a refund case. So that is, um, as, as you know, the money aspect in defending this as Simon was talking about, see, it's a very expensive, expensive proposition um, in regards to what, you know, basically taxpayers who did not get it right are going to be, you know, dealing with. Um, the, you know, other thing that, you know, I think that to me, Stephanie, excuse me, got into, which is if you do find yourself under an audit or your client under an audit, um, they are going to be asking a lot of information. But one of the things that you really have to expect is they're going to want to know, did you engage a promoter or preparer who got paid on a contingency fee? That in the IRS's mind is a red flag for fraud. Now, to a certain degree, most state bars actually for lawyers who do tax cases, they're ethically prohibited from taking a contingency fee in most of these cases. So there's a whole nother underlying problem there. But by and large, things that typically you don't see the IRS asking for um, in audits, um, you know, they are going to get into things that, um, you know, go be well beyond actually your gross receipts and the government orders and all of that. And you're gonna want, you know, additional information, including the communications with your preparers and your promoters in that area. Um, the penalties, um, Kevin, um, you know, that next, you know, the penalties are basically the same here as they are in any kind of, you know, when you got it wrong um, and you got a refund you shouldn't have been entitled to um, or you have an underpayment of your taxes. But I think the thing that you have to pay attention to here is that there are layers. It's not just your employment tax returns. You also have exposure on your income tax returns because there is the flow through. Um, and so it could be a double whammy in regards to um, the implications to, you know, the employers and heaven help you if you're, if your company's an 1120F versus a C. So now you may have three sets of returns that may have tax liabilities that are implicated here as well as um, with regards to the, the penalty. Um, 
So now we can move on to the, I guess maybe the fun stuff in regards to um, the criminal investigation. There's probably nobody who is not potentially um, in the crosshairs of CI, um, other than the fact that they only have, I think, 21 special agents to investigate these cases. So, and they're on their own here. Remember, unlike COVID and PPP, that is an entire Department of Justice task force with law enforcement agencies everywhere. Um, so it's all the other three letter initials, you know, FBI, et cetera, and it's not just um, the IRS. Whereas in this case, pretty much the IRS is kind of on their own. Um, an individual um, employer who has filed um, returns that for ERCs um, that the IRS deems to be improper and that there was willfulness um, definitely could find themselves charged. Um, you know, there are some very easy charges there. Um, and there's not just the false returns, but they're actually fraudulent um, claims. Um, and, you know, um, under a totally different code section besides Title 26, the preparers could be charged, CPAs, um, you know, with regard to individually, because there are individual um, tax, you know, um, crimes um, that can be charged, but they can also be charged as a conspiracy um, with regards to their clients. The promoters are going to be a different area that I think we are, I, I'm going to, you know, get up my crystal ball and say to everyone that we are going to see not only criminal cases, but we are going to see parallel injunction and promoter cases. Because um, in a civil case, if you go after promoters, um, the government can do what's called a disgor disgorgement. So they can actually go after assets um, and not just you know, nor pursue the normal civil tax collection. Um, but they can get a federal court order against promoters um, for basically disgorgement and a judgment against them for amounts that, um, you know, go into whatever it is that they have um, obviously um, not only earned themselves in their fees, but actually caused the harm to the government. And so I do expect, because we've seen that with the syndicated conservation easements, with the, you know other areas where the government uses both tools. And so I should say that we probably can expect that we're going to see that. Um, yeah, and, and we and have Sandra, seen. Go ahead. So, sorry, uh -huh. just to just to chime in, I'm being mindful of the the time. Um, you know, I do want to note for the participants. You know, that there are slides here that that go into some of the cases um, that we've seen, and and. You know, just I'll put this up while you're, you know, you have your, some of your closing thoughts about tips for advising. So that way, Kevin has the opportunity to to show us um, what to know from Answer Connect. So if you have any final closing thoughts on this, that would be great. You got it. So um, again, we do have, there have been criminal cases, and I'll just segue from that. There's been guilty pleas. The numbers are huge. The charges involve things that you know could actually, um, you know, involve forfeitures, but you know, with regards to advising your client on what to do. Look, the law does not require the statutory or um, judicially, the Supreme Court has said there is no obligation to file an amended return. And I have to say one size does not fit all. Um, I think that you have to be very careful in determining, um, you know, what the harm is, um, you know, and what your client's potential exposure is with regards to criminal or civil penalties. Um, but the reality is, is that if you have a client who has potential for um, criminal exposure, um, you know, the best way to get CI to not come knock on the door um, if they aren't already looking is to basically get rid of the jury appeal. If the return has been fixed, if the taxpayer is in the process of making the government whole by making payments, either in whole or making, you know, installment payments, et cetera, and getting on board, um, that's really not the case. Um, I have, you know, juries, juries don't get drug dealers. They don't get human trafficking. They don't get organized crime. They do get taxpayers who have returns that are not accurate because that's who they are. And so they need to be able to say, why are we here? Or I would have never done that. And so, you know, um, you know, getting the best advice in regards to amended returns you know, again, it's very, very individualized, but it is definitely something to consider. Well, thanks everyone for 
you know, mm -hmm. listening to our presentation. I guess, Kevin, we've covered a lot of material. Apologies for, for going over our allotment. Um, but you're always great in showing us just how succinct um, Answer Connect is and showing us what we need to know. So um, I can see your screen of, of showing us Answer Connect. So what, what should I know here? Yeah, excellent, and thank you. Uh, great information from the panelists. Want to appreciate you putting this all together for us. Um, in the last couple of minutes here, what I really want to do is focus a bit on the issue we've been talking about, but really look at it from the perspective of how CCH Answer Connect has changed the way that research can be done and how information can be presented to you to streamline the entire process of aggregating content into a single location without forcing you as the researcher to go to various different areas, various different levels, and look at various different documents to be able to pull this all together. So as our example here, I'm just gonna run a really quick search on employment tax. And you can see from the screen that CCH Answer Connect is already beginning to populate content that you may, as the researcher, consider taking a look at. From our questions and answers, our AI, components that are driving towards employment taxes. Our topic pages, which is a consolidation of information across a large spectrum. And we saw a lot of that today with the uh, employment tax credits. So there's a lot of information here. I'm actually gonna jump directly into our employment tax credit topic page. Because as we heard, there were several pieces going on currently, uh, specifically regarding that notice that came out. Um, Want to make sure that we can be able to show that to you here and you'll notice one of the very first things we've done on this topic pages is, is make you aware that there's a compliant alert regarding this stoppage um, i've already opened this up just an effort to save a little bit of time here but we actually link you directly out to the irs page so you can take a look at this notice specifically going back into this topic page you know, we've talked about a little bit about the um, tax credits in 20 and 21, and what are some of the requirements that are out there? We've brought that into this single topic page. We talked a lot about the employment employee tax credits. What does this mean? Is there a claim withdrawal process that you need to be aware of? Can you give further definition on the supply chain disruptions? A lot of that is covered, and all of that actually is covered here in these topic pages. Moving further down on this page, Again, as we aggregate content, we're gonna talk a little bit about the paid leave credits. I know that was outside of the scope of this presentation, but it all ties back into the employment tax credits. As an orientation further within this topic page is we're trying to give you as the researcher visibility to additional content. So we've talked about the employment tax credits. There's also the deferral of employment tax deposits and payments. You can see again, all of that information is brought to you directly here. One of the additional items that we have within our topic pages is our client impact events. I'm gonna actually open this up in a new tab here so we can take a quick look at this. But again, this is where the editorial team has gone and taken a look at a very specific issue and presented it to you in even further breakdown, further guidance. Uh, this one erroneous funds is finalized. We're gonna give you that information. You can see it was from a couple of months ago. But that workflow that we looked at on the topic pages are similar. We give you the overview the application, your client profile, who would be impacted by this, effective dates that you need to be aware of, recommended topics, so on and so forth. So again, that is information that's specific to this very narrow scope issue. Going back to the topic page we just came from, we do have access to our key primary source, whether it's the enacted laws, if you wanna go directly to regulations, the editorial team has again curated this to bring the content to you from a single source. I've not had to run multiple searches. I've not had to go back to a search results list. I'm actually able to take a look at that directly. We've also compiled practice aids. Is there decision tools? Are there work papers? Are there election and compliance statements? All that information that you can now take and actually make it actionable directly from this site. I'm gonna drop down to the bottom of this just this page and uh, wanna call, cover one other quick item here is CPE, professional development. Again, as opposed to having to go and find these somewhere, the editorial team have brought them to your attention. So if you need to take a look at the COVID-19 update, payroll, payroll fraud and PPP programs, we have courses on those. I'm gonna jump back up to my, rec my key primary sources and again, just talk a little bit about the how this information has been put together. So if I need to take a look at in, uh, code 3111 in this instance, by simply opening this up, the editorial team has again brought all the content related to this specific code section 
to you in what we've entitled our 360 view. So you have the complete code section, you have all related regulations to 3111. All cases, administrative guidance, current rulings are all here available as well. The forms uh, and additional content. I know we are hitting the end of our time frame here, so would love to spend some more time talking to you about this, but I think you'll have an opportunity to uh, have one of our associates reach out to you if you're so interested in looking further. And with that, Margaret, I will turn it back to you for the final polling question. Thank you, Kevin. That wraps up today's webinar. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their participation. As a reminder, CPE credit will be posted within two to four business days. You will receive an email with the link to the course evaluation and your certificate of completion. Today's webinar has also been recorded. You will receive an email with access to the link within 24 hours. Thank you for attending. Uh, feel free to fill out this final poll if you're interested in learning more. And have a great day.